Well, I don't think any of us are going to be traveling first class by plane anytime soon, considering the situation in the world. But you can definitely travel first class by road because Mercedes-Benz have just launched their S-Class SUV, the GLS. What are the perks of first class road travel? Let's find out. To begin with, let's explain that the last GLS was more of a name change than a whole new model. It was the ML's underpinnings that were stretched to make the GL that then became the GLS. The new GLS aims to step up the game on every level to be an S-Class SUV and take on the likes of the X7, the Q7 and the Land Rover Discovery that also offer 7-seat luxury SUVs. Now, when you see it up close, it is indeed massive. It is a whole 77 mm longer and 22 mm wider than before, but the big number is the 60 mm more between the wheels, meaning there should be a lot more cabin space. Well, it is all new, but the design is not drastically different. It is softer and it is rounder, especially at the rear, and it is lighter than before. Design changes are more evolutionary than revolutionary. The front end is beefy with plenty of chrome to suit Indian customer likings. It carries the trademark grille flanked by multi-beam headlamps and a strong chin with skid plates in chrome. The large air dams on the side are connected by the strip that separates the two halves of the bumper and they too have a chrome slash across. And the side profile makes you realise how long the GLS really is. The A-pillar is steeply raked and the waistline runs quite high. There's a smart set of alloys shod with thick rubber. Tyres front and rear are different sizes with 275, 45, 21 in front and 315, 40, 21 at the rear. Yes, they are massive. Once again, there's a liberal use of chrome on the roof rail, window surround and floorboard too. The rear rounds it off nicely and quite literally too. The edges are softer and the more contoured tailgate hides how massive it really is. It definitely looks like the S-Class of SUVs. Once you open this massive tailgate, you can see that with all three rows up, there still is a sufficient amount of luggage room. In fact, a couple of small suitcases can easily fit in here. And of course, if you want to fit some more, you can always flip the last few rows down. And that's by a touch of a button. You can fold or open out both rows via seat buttons at the rear and that is super convenient. With all rows up, it's 355 litres and you can open that up to a massive 2,400 litres. Well, the interior of the GLS is all new and it is really, really nice to look at. It is in sync with the new design language of Mercedes. There's that single seamless piece of glass that houses the infotainment and the dials. Twin 12.3 inch screens, looks really nice here. Lower half has the vents, which is very much like the S-Class, four of them laid out neatly. There are buttons and dials. There's layers to the dash, which make it look really interesting. Ambient lighting to spruce it up. Lots of storage areas, wireless charging, a steering with every conceivable control you can find. And of course, a spacious cabin. The cabin is spacious and making it feel even more open is the large panoramic sunroof. However, that means there is no sunroof over the third row which was there before. There is also the Mercedes Me app which lets you check on the status of the car remotely, start and pre-cool or preheat it and you can even open or close the sunroof and windows. It also allows functions like geofencing, locating your car and setting up service appointments. The good part is that Mercedes intend to keep updating the app with additional features which can be done over the air. Another funky interior feature is the motion sensing light. Now as far as the regular features go, there is also a large list. Let's take a look. The rear seat also gets its usual list of luxury goodies and we will talk of them a little later. But for now, let's check out the third row, which is the reason a large lot of people opt for this SUV. Getting into the third row is pretty easy, single touch. Just takes a little while for everything to happen. But access is quite easy and for someone as slim as me, even if I say so myself, 
or as short as me, it's pretty easy to get into the third row. Single touch button to get the seat back into its position again. And what these buttons do is actually optimize the space between the two seats. So as you can see, it's left this backrest a little bit more upright. I'm sure the middle row passenger would want to lean it back because otherwise it becomes a little too upright for the middle row. However, even with that, there is a good enough amount of legroom for someone my size. Nice headroom, shoulder room is good as well. So yeah, for, for people like me, I could sit on a long journey here, no problem. While it is good enough, the third row doesn't feel any more spacious than before. But the fact of the matter is, the middle row is the place to be in the GLS and that's where I'm going to start my journey. This is the place to be in this car, I can say that. There is just acres of room. Yep, I know what you're going to say. Gavin and me are not the best representation of what space is in the back seat. But here's a picture of two tall people sitting one behind the other. And as you can see, there still is ample leg room. So yes, there is loads and loads of leg room here in the middle row. And the thing is, there is a hundred millimeters of travel to adjust the seat so you can really optimize the space even if they're two tall people sitting one behind the other and still have ample leg room you do sit a little lower than you did before in the GLS and it's possibly because this seat has a very low age point so it's kind of angled like that and as a result you feel like there's a little bit of extra under thigh support the seat back itself is quite upright and you do have recline but it is just the slightest of amount. Still, you can get really really comfortable here in the back seat and it is premium travel. So the extra space between the wheels has really been used to optimize the middle row of seats. And while it is super spacious and comfortable, with the recline angle a little compromised, it isn't quite S-class like comfort. Now you do have every amenity here in this back seat, beginning with this massive panoramic sunroof that just opens it up and makes it feel so spacious and airy. And of course you have the tablet which allows you to operate all the functions that you would have otherwise had to access the infotainment system for. I can also take this tablet out and use it to either surf the internet, watch a movie, whatever I'd like. Wireless charging, small storage space, sun blinds as well. Super comfortable with everything on hand. What we did miss, however, on the rear tablet was the navigation option as a key feature that a rear passenger may like at hand. The tablet can only be used for radio, media and ambient light settings. There is another optional package, however, that offers more for backseat screens and entertainment. Well, let's begin with the fact that this has really big wheels and it does have the air suspension. So there is suppleness to the ride. It rounds off bumps and potholes and it's very little filter through to the passenger in this back seat. So largely it is very comfortable. But when you hit a really bad patch of road like I have now, as you can see, I'm getting quite moved around the back there is that rocking motion when the surface is really uneven the cabin itself is well insulated and keeps you swathed in silence so there's plenty to keep you pampered and isolated from the world outside when you're in the back seat but how about the driver's seat time to check that out starting with a real cool party trick Okay, so time to get behind the wheel and normally when you get into a car, the first thing you really do is reach for the seat settings and adjust the seat. But here in this car, it will do it for you. I need to go to settings. I need to go to seat positioning. I need to set my height, which is 5'4", and start positioning. It's quite cool. Seat back, seat base, under thigh, steering, all adjusted. 
Unfortunately, I think Mercedes hasn't got it quite right for me. How may I help you? And here's the other thing. You need to say Mercedes in this car or even remotely similar words and the voice assistant springs to life a little too eagerly. And this can be an irritant at times. What can I do for you? But coming back to the seat settings. I prefer my steering a little lower. Pace a little further back. Backrest and a little more height for me. Now, why do I need that height? Because, well, this dash line is quite high with the screen that goes right up to the top. And the bonnet line is high as well. And talking about that, this car feels massive from behind the wheel. The bonnet stretches out way in front of you. And well, the rear, well, that feels like it's an entirely different postcode. Have to say that the steering does the job of making this massive behemoth feel quite easy to drive. The new GLS has been launched with two engines, a petrol and a diesel. We'll get to the petrol in a bit, but the one I'm driving now is the 400D that uses Merck's new generation OM656 straight six diesel engine. As the name suggests, this 400D is more powerful than the 350D version in the S Class and it makes a colossal 330 HP and 700 Nm of torque. But then it needs all that torque to move its hefty 2.5 ton weight around. This diesel engine is super refined and you barely can tell that it is a diesel. In fact, you really can't. When you put your foot down, it actually takes on a really nice sporty note and it's not something you expect in a large massive SUV like this, so it's actually quite a pleasant surprise. Performance is strong, it does feel powerful, but there's no real whack of torque. It's just one nice swell of power that gets stronger as you pass the 2000 RPM mark. The performance really masks the bulk of the car and the refined manner in which it accelerates often doesn't let you realize just how quick you're going. The 0 to 100 acceleration time is also pretty darn good for something this big. There are also drive modes to choose from, but you'll only find three. Comfort, Eco and Off-Road. There's no Sport mode to make the suspension firmer, the engine more responsive or the gear shift snappier. So you know that Mercedes have aimed this at being the comfortable cruiser, not something they want you to hustle around. The 9-speed gearbox is quite nice and you know, when you're ambling around and you're gentle with the throttle, it actually responds quite well and quite quickly. It's only when you need that urgent requirement of power and you press your foot down, it takes a tick to react and it will drop two or three gears down, but sometimes it fumbles a bit before finding the right gear. You can, however, always take manual control with the paddles. So that which will likely be the version of choice for most when it comes to a big SUV like this. But in case you're one that would prefer a petrol, Gavin is currently driving the 450. Now, if you thought the diesel version was refined, this 450 petrol is eerily quiet. In fact, when you're at low revs, it's so quiet you can barely tell it's turned on. There are hardly any vibrations that come through either. You only start to hear it when you wind it up to about two and a half or 3000 RPM and then you'll find that it has a nice straight six snarl. It too uses a new generation engine, a straight six turbo petrol which produces 367 horsepower and 500 newton meters of torque. But it has another trick up its sleeve a 48 volt electrical system that provides additional electric boost of 22 horsepower and 250 newton meters under hard acceleration. So if you thought the diesel car's 0 to 100 time of 7.48 seconds was impressive, when we attached our V-Box testing gear to this GLS 450, the behemoth of an SUV managed to do 0 to 100 kph in just 7.15 seconds. So the petrol is definitely the sportier of the two and while you certainly will not miss the absence of a sport mode in the diesel version, you might just miss it in this one because it does have the potential to be quite a lot of fun. 
But before you let all that power go to your head and try to hustle the GLS quickly, you need to remind yourself how big and tall this SUV is. This is really a car you don't want to push around corners and that's because it's really tall, it's really wide, it's really long and it feels very top heavy and has loads of body roll in corners. And yes, while the model overseas can be equipped with the company's clever e-active body control suspension, you know, with the active anti-roll bars that keep it level in the corners, the Indian version does not have that. And it's a bit of a shame because actually this steering is very, very good. You'll have heard Renuka say earlier how the steering is very easy and makes light work of steering this big SUV. But once you start to go faster, it actually puts on a good amount of weight and gives you confidence. So even though it's not quite the corner carver, you can rest assured that at least when you're making lane change maneuvers out on the expressway, you can do it with peace of mind. And what was really unexpected was the ability to do really tight U-turns in this massive, massive SUV just so easily. While the steering may make it easy to turn though, there is no taking away from the fact that it is huge. And you'll feel that even more in the city, where you'll find yourself constantly watching the corners. And chances are, it will probably stick out of your parking spot too. So that's the GLS, a larger-than-life expression of everything a modern Mercedes has to offer. And the price for all the space and opulence, 99.9 .9 lakh rupees. Whether you choose the petrol or the diesel, although these are introductory. That puts it just a whisker under the price of its main rival, the BMW X7. And since Mercedes calls it the S-Class of SUVs, you'll be interested to know that it costs about 38 lakhs less than the sedan. Now, if you're expecting S-Class like comfort, then you'd better buy the sedan because the GLS isn't nearly as comfortable or as luxurious, especially in the back seat. But if you're looking for a super luxe SUV, then the GLS ticks off all the right boxes. Its all-conquering size and look give it a road presence few others can match. It's got a strong pair of engines, the interior is well finished and equipped and most of all, it is hugely spacious, even for seven and their luggage. This is truly the Mercedes that can do it all.